Hello, I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about stimulants might actually help your brain and your kid's brain. So I'll be talking for about 20, 25 minutes. This video may wind up being considered really longer, depending on how many questions are there at the end. The questions may be on this topic or other topics. And without further ado, as usual, I will start with the take-home message. So the take-home message is that there are certainly legitimate concerns about starting taking stimulants yourself for ADHD or starting your kids on stimulants, but the evidence is still pretty overwhelming that stimulants help a greater percentage of people with ADHD than any other treatment modality that's been tested, and they help reduce symptoms to a greater extent than any other modality. So they are still the number one choice for that reason. That doesn't mean they fit everyone. And even though they have the highest success rate, they don't help everyone. So that's one reason to be leery about it. And two is there are known risks to taking the stimulants. So they have measurable, small but measurable effects on growth for kids who are still growing. Um, that's less relevant to adults. There's some small but real cardiovascular risk, which increases at least to some extent with time, and I have a video on that. There is a risk for addiction. So most studies suggest somewhere between two, three, four percent of kids or adults may wind up addicted to the stimulants themselves. I would argue most of the data suggests that the overall risk of a substance abuse problem decreases for those with ADHD on the stimulants. And there's a risk for psychosis with Adderall products. It's probably about one out of 500, I think. And again, I have a video on that, but it is, to my mind, the most serious and under-discussed bad side effect for stimulant medication. But the biggest, at least the most common complaint I hear from, or worry, concern from parents and what's frequently put out by non uh, professionals who don't use medications or advocate for um, advocate other approaches is that stimulants damage the brain. They cause brain rot. They kill brain cells. They're going to kill your brain. They're going to harm your brain. These are bad, bad, evil drugs. And the talk of today is, is discussing that there is virtually no solid evidence to support that therapeutic doses of prescription stimulants have detrimental brain effects in kids or adults. So, and what I'll be talking about is a, so we have more than 30 studies suggesting long-term and short-term use is actually the opposite. It's associated with normalization of brain structures and function, not deterioration. So to launch right into it, where where is this concern or problem about stimulants coming from. So one is, you know, we do have good data that stimulants can increase or not, or not. People can become addicted or abuse or misuse their stimulant medications. I have a talk on misuse and that's important to differentiate it from abuse or addiction. Certainly many, many people with ADHD do not use their stimulants exactly as prescribed. I don't think most of that reflects either abuse or addiction. And again, psychosis is a really serious, because it's often unre irreversible. Um, one out of five people with a single episode of amphetamine-induced psychosis wind up in a permanent psychotic state. This is a serious, although not really common side effect, but given its seriousness, even five, one out of 500 is too common. And there is documented evidence, particularly with methamphetamine and cocaine, that there are correlations, there are studies indicating brain damage, acute effects, damaging effects of taking meth and cocaine. And there are certainly rodent models where stimulants are administering stimulants to rats and mice, um, results in inflammatory brain changes and cellular death. So to put that in perspective, again, methamphetamine and cocaine are different than dextroamphetamine, levoamphetamine, con constituents of Adderall, 
or Vyvanse or some of the others, or of methylphenidate. And in general, both people who are addicting or addicted or abusing street stimulants and particularly the rodent models are using dosages that are much higher and probably at least as importantly, not just bigger doses, they're going in much quicker. So if you're smoking, if you're snorting um, stimulants, that's gonna go in or speedballing, injecting um, stimulants, and speedball stimulant and usually an opioid like heroin. Um, but if you're, that's going into the body much faster and there is really good evidence that it's not just how big a dose you're getting, but how quickly it's flooding those receptors. So we know that inflammatory problems, cell death are correlated with really big doses, but really fast doses. Most of the previous animal research, rodent research has looked at dosages in the range of 50 milligrams per kilogram or higher. Um, to put that in perspective, therapeutic doses of these prescription stimulants are in the 0.2 to 2 milligram, milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, so those dosages on rodents were 25 to 250 times bigger. And some of that is valid in that rodents metabolize, their, their bodies chew it up faster. But most of the studies involved intraperitoneal into the body cavity injections where the absorption is less faster. So more recent studies getting either gastric lavage, which rats and mice don't particularly like, which is using a syringe and then shooting water, a solution of the drug into the stomach, or just putting it in water bottles and letting them drink of their own volition. Um, those studies, even at dosages bigger than human therapeutic studies, don't see the brain inflammatory effects, don't show the brain damage, atrophy in different brain regions that have been demonstrating with bigger doses. Again, that's reassuring, but what's even more reassuring is looking at the human data. So there is a, this is getting old now, it's a 2013 study, um, a meta-analysis done by Biederman and Faraone and Spencer and a few of the big names in ADHD research, where they looked through dozens of studies. They found 29 imaging studies that were looking at the effects of stimulants on the brains of kids and adults with ADHD. So among those 29 studies, six were MRI anatomic studies, 20 were functional MRI studies looking at activation of different brain studies, brain areas, and three were spectroscopy studies looking at connectivity. So the important thing is the vast bulk of these studies were naturalistic. They were not um, random blind treatment. Um, so the naturalistic means they took kids or adults who were on stimulants for a very varying periods of time and looked at their brains and compared them both to drug naive people in, with ADHD. So you have an ADHD comparison group and usually to a unfortunately time healthy normal. So people without ADHD who weren't on drugs either. Um, the studies varied in terms of how long individuals were on the medications. Um, so some didn't specify. Many people were on at least for a year. Um, some as long as four years or more. So what did the study show? So the MRI, so again, that's six studies looking at just the anatomical impact. Um, these were all case controlled, so they were comparing to, so they found subjects who were, had been on stimulants. They matched those stimulants to people who had not been taking stimulants in term, but who had comparable severity of ADHD, same gender, same age. Um, some of them controlled for other factors and then compared them to a non-ADHD population also matched for age and um, some other variables. Um, the, in the anatomic studies, the, these were all basically kid or adolescents, the age range was four to 20. And in all six studies, there were 
people with ADHD who are found to have alterations in their brain structure and those with unmedicated ADHD compared to the non-ADHD control group. And in all six studies, treatment with stimulant medication attenuated or lessened the degree of abnormalities in at least a portion of the regions assessed. Now, each of the studies looked at multiple areas in the brain. Each of the study looked at different sets of them. It's not that stimulant treatment normalized all the, well, for sake of a better word, abnormal areas or all the differences in ADHD brains compared to control, but in at least some of them, um, including effects on the rates of change in cortical thickness and including certain structural sizes. Now, most of the, there are many areas where the, the medication group had no effects or no change. So when you looked at big structures like the overall amount of gray matter volume, the total volume of the basal ganglia deep inside the brain or the cerebellar volume, um, none of the studies found that medications had a big impact there. But if you looked at smaller regions, smaller subsets, again, in comparing the ADH group is smaller or atrophied compared to the non-ADHD group. And for these smaller regional differences, in many cases, the stimulant had normal, more normal looking brains after treatment with stimulants. And in no situations was medication associated with worsening of brain findings relative to control. So the stimulants didn't shrink or atrophy or damage any of the brain regions. Jumping over to the functional MRI studies, um, and again, these looked at different areas. Given that's a functional MRI, they're asking people to perform certain tasks which were designed to elicit certain stim or certain symptoms of ADHD. Um, many of them included, most of them included looking at the striatum, the caudium putamen, anterior cingulate cortex, which is an area we know is involved in attention, emotion control, inhibition control, reward, motivation, and monitoring of errors, and looked at the prefrontal cortex. So most of the studies looked at those striatum, anterior cingulate cortex, prefrontal cortex. Many of them looked at additional areas as well. And again, they were comparing what's the alteration in function that we see in people with ADHD versus controls without ADHD. And what do we see when people are on stimulants? So some of these looked at the history of having been on stimulants. Some of these looked at rather acute effects of being on stimulants versus stopping stimulants. There were variations in washout periods in terms of how long you had to be off of it to be retested. But in 19 out of 20 of these studies, um, the stimulants attenuated or shrank the differences in activation that were seen between those with ADHD and controlled people who have no ADHD. And that attenuation wasn't necessarily in all regions or that were looked at, but in at least a portion of the regions that were examined, Again, being on a stimulant made those kids with ADHD or those adults, so about a quarter of the studies were adults in this group, um, more normal-like. Um, there were, at least for the studies, there did find some areas of the brain where there was actually an increased difference from the control by, from being on the stimulant. And it was thought that these areas that showed greater difference from the control group compared to just having ADHD alone were reflective of <clears throat> compensated, compens compensatory hyperactivation. So there was an increase in prefrontal cortex in a few studies and during intention tasks and reward tasks, there was an increased activation in the inferior parietal lobe in a go, non-go, so a measure of inhibition task. There was increased hyper increased activation of the cerebellar verma, so central part of the cerebellum in a continuous performance task. And there's increased activation in insulin in at least one distracted working memory test. Um, if we jump over to the functional connectivity studies, in all three of those studies, um, 
individuals with ADHD had hypoactivation compared to individuals without ADHD in certain circuits. And in all cases, being on stimulant medication activated those hypoactive connections and again, made them look more normal. Um, this was happened in ventral anterior cingulate cortex to prefrontal cortex. It happened in amygdala to lateral prefrontal. And in the third study, it happened in a whole range of um, circuitry they were looking at. So the summary that the authors gave to their summary was that, again, these were chronic naturalistic treatments with stimulants are naturalistic as they were just soliciting people who are already on stimulants. Um, so their conclusion was that being on stimulants attenuated the ADHD related brain structural differences, but this was not a global change. It was a targeted um, regional specific improvement as it were, and specifically frontal cortex, striatum, cerebellum, and corpus callosum seem to be most significantly improved as it were, or more normalized, or again, treatment with stimulants made these brains look more like normal in these regions. Um, so it, the, uh, the authors did point out that there are some caveats that given that these were naturalistic studies, um, people were recruited based on, uh, have you been on stimulants or are you stimulant and naive? Have you never been on them? So because of that, we can't determine causation. So theoretically, maybe all these people were on stimulants, they were self-selected and they knew that their brains were going to get better, start looking better five years or a year after starting it. Or they, so again, we can't absolutely determine causation, but the very consistency of these studies, again, 19 out of 20 of the activations, six out of six of so this, the structural look, again, all supporting that being on the stimulants improve the brains and my assumption clinically and many other researchers would be a well is that it's more likely in most areas, maybe not all, that it's the kids who have most severe, most impairing symptoms who are more likely to wind up on treatment or the adults, given that there are barriers to treatment and stigma regarding treatment. So it's actually maybe a particularly strong finding that those brains were more normalized at the end of treatment or at the end of the time point of looking at it. Other problems with, with looking at these studies that the, these individuals, again, were on the stimulants for different durations of time. Um, there were different washes. So it's some of the activation studies were looking at people who were on medication, then did some washout period of hours, days, or weeks before restudying them to see what their brain looked like off the medication but again, with still having had a history of being on medication. So there's a lot of inconsistency among those studies. But in the 10 years, and I have not found the analysis since then, there have been a number of other studies, all I would argue showing consistently that again, none of the studies in humans are showing any association with damage to different brain regions, heightened brain inflammation, correlated with taking stimulants versus not taking stimulants. Um, and particularly all of the acute studies suggest that the acute short-term effects of the stimulants are to make brain activation, activity, circuitry, connectivity look more like normals than non-normals. So one of the studies and I'm picking it up because it was a particularly well done study by Shaw and his colleagues looked at the singular opercular network and it was multiple time points of being studied over at least a six year period. So the singular opercular network is a network involved in monitoring errors and initiating and adapting control. Um, and previous studies had shown that stimulants stabilize this network and their study, again, looking over time, showed that those individuals who had a good response to stimulants showed a stable degree of connectivity in this network, which was similar, again, to what we see in normals 
normals, meaning people without ADHD. So there was a steady strengthening, but in those who actually had a bad response, didn't respond well to the stimulants, no clinical and minimal clinical improvement, there was actually an over-strengthening of this pathway. So again, this is one study, depending on how you look at the results, and that, that suggests those who are getting a good response to the stimulant are having a brain that looks more like a normal brain at the end of the treatment. And again, the simplest explanation is that those who are not getting a good symptomatic response to the stimulant in this treatment, we have to hyper strengthen the um, singular opercular network, that that may well be a compensatory mechanism because the medication itself wasn't providing enough changes. So I should point out a few other things that, um, so a few other things. So one of the other recent studies and it's in the references, this looked at heterogeneity or differences within the group of people with ADHD. So this study um, divided people with ADHD into those who for family history and other reasons were at low risk for substance use disorders versus those who were high risk and then looked at the effect of stimulants and there were different effects in specific areas of the brain, reward processing parts of the brain in these two groups. So one thing we need to be careful of is that there may well be subgroups or differential response within the group of individuals with ADHD. Um, the other thing that I think is important to point out is that medications are not the only thing that can change, certainly at least brain activation. So there's at least CBT studies, there's at least one neurofeedback study that showed that, again, like medication, stimulant medications, that in brain and regions that are relevant to ADHD, where we can see discrepant activation or lower levels of, inact of activity in ADHD brains, that certain treatments like CBT and neurofeedback can boost activation in those areas so that those brains resemble more like non-ADHD brains. Um, so in some way though, I think this fundamentally flips the issue of, oh my God, I shouldn't treat my kid or myself with stimulants because they're gonna rot my brain completely around because it strongly suggests it does not prove the likelihood. I mean, we know, particularly looking at kids, that about a third of kids do seem to substantially outgrow their ADHD, about two thirds don't. And one of the questions this raises, are we consigning kids with ADHD to a life of forever or more severe ADHD by not treating them at an early age? Again, all of this research as a bulk shows that the treatment with stimulants not just helps symptomatic improvement, but seems to make brains look more less like ADHD brains and more like general population brains. So again, by failing to treat, by failing to offer or make available stimulants, we may be relegating individuals to more ADHD across their lifespan. So that's about all I have to say for today's topic. Next week's topic is the connection between non-COVID and ADHD. And I think there's at least one question. So, okay, a lock, just, just thanking me for the video. Thank you're welcome. Um, so Chelsea B asks, and, I, and there's a dot, 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 so I'm not seeing if there's more to it. Um, and Ritalin is more neuroprotective. So most of the, some of these studies did not actually differentiate what the history, whether it was Adderall or Ritalin. There have not been head-to-head -head studies that I am aware of comparing neuroprotective effects or neurorestorative effects of Ritalin and amphetamine. I should point out there have been a few studies with Stratera, so this is not
specifically just a nerve, um, a stimulant effect, whether or not Ritalin itself is a stimulant. You can look at my video on that one. So it, we don't have the data on some of the, I, I don't know much the data on brain scans in guanfacine or modafinil, or if we do have any in the setting of ADHD, the presumption would be to the extent that they are helping, they are probably also helping normalize in a structural and brain activation and connectivity level. Oh, so hello, Dennis. So Dennis asks, um, do stimulants help improve neuroplasticity? So I would argue that that you know that, that the summation of what I'm saying today is is a demonstration of neuroplasticity that kids or adults who are treated with stimulants have brains that change compared to unmedicated kids and brain change either through the intervention of medications or through other training or other environmental factors as a display of neuroplasticity. Um, so if the question is, do they help engineer neuroplasticity? I would say yes. Um, improve suggests compared to what? Um, so if you're improved, so is it compared to not having stimulants? Probably that's what I'd say the dev evidence shows. So Mr. AKA 1996, what are some of these longer term studies showing in respect to the time it takes to see any significant increase in size and function of prefrontal cortex and adult ADHD brains who started stims in adulthood? So one thing that, yeah, I, I don't have the good, I don't have a simple answer. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning is that the studies just looking at neuroanatomical differences, there is a lot of variation in terms of some studies find differences between, the, and so, the, so this is without even treatment, just looking at how do ADHD brains differ from non-ADHD non brains. And although we have some areas where multiple studies have found differences, there are lots of studies that find differences in areas other studies don't see a difference. There are lots of studies that fail to find a difference where a few or many others do. Whether this is all due to heterogeneity and ADHD is probably not one simple thing, whether it's um, some people have kept citing, you know, brain movement, head movement is a common can add lots of artifact and the group who's most likely to move their heads around are those with ADHD or so I don't think we have good data or anything that would definitively say how long it takes an adult to show any changes in structural brain size as a result of taking stimulant medication. That's so OC asks, is skin picking, nail biting more related to anxiety or ADHD? So officially, and a week or two ago, I talked about hoarding behavior. So hoarding and skin picking and um, hair pulling trichotillomania are lumped in the OCD spectrum of conditions. Um, so the thought is that there's sort of evolutionary grooming behavior origins, at least to skin picking and trichotillomania and some of the OCD, very common obsessions and compulsions. Um, so there's, so again, so, so the claim would be the connection is more to obsessive compulsive diagnoses or conditions rather than to anxiety or to ADHD. So, so the OCD spectrum is no longer a subset or put inside the anxiety. Clearly, many individuals have an increase in nail biting or skin picking when they're feeling anxious. And I've also seen ADHD medications increase fingernail biting or cuticle picking. I've also seen cases that went exactly the opposite. I've had people who had chronic problems there who, um, benefited from being on stimulant medication. So 
I've had one other request to do a segment on nail biting, skin picking, and ADHD. So I will try to look into whether there's enough real data to say more about it than I just said. So Lowell asks, should we assume that the benefits seen from stimulants can be maintained even if one goes off of stimulants? Or is it like exercise where we need to maintain a level of consistency indefinitely? So the way we would study that is a sort of a, as you outlined that you would look at people who've been on stimulants for five years or 10 years or one year, and you then you would look at them at a group that continues on the medication and you'd compare it to someone who's been off for a year or two years or three years. I am not aware of any neuroanatomic neuroimaging study that looks at it systematically in terms of functioning I'm not even that aware of symptomatologic. I mean, part of it is the big fact forces funding medication studies or their effects of the drug companies, and none of them have any incentive to demonstrate that either that you're going to retain benefit being off of it, um, or that you're going to have any benefit when you're not taking the medication. So I, I don't think we have a lot of hard data to speak to that. And part of it, I would say, is that part of dealing with, so I would argue stimulants or any medication, even though the maybe the best option or most potent option are never a complete option. So part of dealing, working with ADHD, and this paraphrase is something that um, Ed Hallowell, Driven to Distraction author writes is that, the best advice for someone with ADHD is finding the job that fits you and finding a partner that works well with you. So people with ADHD need the right amount of structure, the right amount of interest, excitement, motivation. Um, and often through medication, often through trial and error, often through therapy, people find or work and discover strategies, niches in life that work well for them. Um, so I've certainly seen people who got benefit from medication for years and then were able to go off their medication, but their life at the time they went off medication was in a very different place through, again, a variety of factors. Um, so, so Ella's asking, I think the same question in a somewhat different way. Are these permanent changes? Is that correct? So the presumption, particularly the anatomical changes, is that they are at least semi-permanent. Um, th that's the presumption, but again, almost no data looking, most of the studies looked at a single you know, time point or follow-up. Uh, so Dennis is asking, do you agree with Dr. Joanna Moncrieff, who says that neurogenesis isn't always good for example, she said that neurogenesis occurs in response to brain injury. So, yeah, I, I don't know the specific research showing neurogenesis, which would be not just neuroplasticity, but making new brain cells happens in response to injury. I mean, I would say certainly other parts of the body making new cells is part of healing and sometimes healing goes awry or misconnects or misfires or miss, you know, produces more scar tissue and damage than you had otherwise. So I would, to me, it would be very surprising if all neurogenesis was positive. Um, that's how I'd answer that one. So Herman Musimbi says, how do you feel about changing the goal of ADHD treatment from medication response to remission? Um, so he cites a paper by Steele from 2005, uses a standard of something like a sub 18 score on the ADHD um, symptom scale. What are your thoughts? I mean, my thought is our goal is always to help people to the greatest extent we can without causing side effects or problems. So, so that speaks, and I think one of my few years ago talks is about how, you know, what's a strategy for dosage? So the strategy isn't just 
oh, you have a substantial response on the very first dose of Ritalin you tried, let's just stop there. I don't know any expert or person with experience in the field who advocates that. I'd say we pretty much all advocate starting low and pretty quickly increasing the dose if you're not having side effects and if you're seeing effects until the point where you have substantial symptomatic relief or including you know, virtually no impairing symptoms. So, I mean, so one question is in formal studies, we often have a criteria to lump people into two groups. Did they respond or not respond? That's most often where a certain cutoff of 25% reduction in the ADHD scale is used. I don't see clinically too many clinicians saying, oh, you've hit 25% improvement, let's back off on doing anything more. So I think some of your question might reflect more a um, difference between clinical research and clinical practice. Um, so I, I might have beat that question to death there. Um, yeah. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Um, here's one more, Mr. AK, 1996. That one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna duck that one. So his question is, would you rather fight a horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? I'm ducking that one, I'm getting hoarse, I'm begging off. Um, so thanks, you've been great with your questions. If you have questions later, I do answer them on YouTube. And stay healthy, stay happy. And next week we'll be looking into the connection between post-COVID symptoms and ADHD. Good night.